Okay, so welcome. My name is Daniel, and I'm going to be the responsible for the course uh, 2DV50E, which is the Bachelor Thesis course. Today, we're going to talk about what scientific work is. Uh, we're going to talk about the communication strategy for this course. It's, I mean, it's one of the more complex courses because there are many different people involved, so we need to communicate. Uh, we're going to talk about the timeline of the course, uh, what a student project proposal is, uh, what next, and we're going to talk about the workshops, and then we're going to um, let you ask some questions. So let's start with what scientific work is, and maybe it will work like this. Can we just... I need to start it. Can you see... The slides still no, no. It's not gonna work like that. I'm gonna move it. Okay. So do you still see the the slides? Yes, we see the sentence. What is scientific work? So, what is scientific work? So um every scientific work needs to begin with um uh, some kind of literature overview of the existing work. So these white things uh, are papers or uh, theses that other people have done. So perhaps students, perhaps uh, scientists, perhaps there there have been work done by some companies. All of that is in the background. So every thesis needs to present a background on what the state of art was before your thesis. And you can see that there is a gap between uh, these papers. So we have the possibility of doing another study. So this gap or the possibility of doing another st study is called a research gap. And this is super important. If we don't have a research gap, we don't have a thesis. So in order to find the research gap, we need to look at what exists today. Uh, and that means reading what other people have done. And people have done a lot, so we need to do a lot of reading. Uh, and that is what every thesis should start with. And that is also uh, what I want you to start with, whatever idea you have. Um, it's quite good to have some kind of limitation of what you read, because we don't want to read everything published in computer science. We're never going to finish that, right? Probably more things published than we can you know, continue to read. Um, okay, but if we have found something that is sort of missing in the background, the, the knowledge gap, and we can talk about that knowledge gap like this. So some people have done this thing, some other people have done this other thing, but no one has done what I'm going to do. That is really, you know, how you present a research gap. And what I call the... What you intend to do, I call that the knowledge contribution. It's a big gray cloud here now, but um, really the knowledge contribution does not need to cover the entire research gap because we can have an area which is sparsely populated by, uh, by, by other people's work. And there might be many opportunities to do different kind of knowledge contribution for this for one single gap. So for instance, we could have uh, multiple student groups or multiple students working on the same research gap, but they do different knowledge contributions. So uh, for instance, if the research gap is that no one has examined what it means to have, um, what, what it means um, to have a lack of automated unit tests for a particular kind of project. So, so no one has examined that, perhaps a particular framework or something like that. And then different students do different knowledge com contribution in this. They do different things. So they collect different kinds of information in order to, to cover some part of the knowledge gap. And each of these we call their knowledge contribution. This... Um, expression knowledge contribution i think it's it's quite important because we should contribute with new knowledge 
So there are existing knowledge and we contribute with new knowledge. So if we don't contribute with new, new knowledge, we don't have a thesis. So new knowledge needs to be produced. And so the dark cloud needs to be, you know, removed by some kind of light. So we do some kind of change or we examine something. The change could be that, okay, we there is no current you know plugin for chrome that does this and this uh so we do some kind of change in the world we create something new or we uh, examine something in a new way but the change in itself could be you know um i, I mean that needs to be something that that is new that it does not exist or it needs to have not been examined in a specific way. So perhaps um, if we're examining something, we can talk to developers or talk about how they think about testing without use, using unit tests, or we can, you know, we can um, uh, observe programmers doing this thing, or we can examine something. And I call that a careful ev evaluation of the change that we, we made. And what we do when we do something carefully is that we do it systematically. And a systematic thing in science is called a methodology. So you, you follow some kind of scheme or you follow a process very carefully in order to collect information on, on the change that happened. Uh, and when you collect the information, that could be that you measure something, that you talk to people, you do interviews, for instance, or you collect their, um, their opinions, you do surveys or that you, you know, you test something yourself, but you carefully evaluate something. And that careful evaluation needs to be done in a way, or it needs to be done, uh, in, yeah, in a way that no one has done before. Because if someone has done the exact same careful evaluation, uh, you will end up with the same results. Uh, but if you do it differently, and sometimes only small differences are needed, uh, we can get uh, new data, new knowledge, uh, and then we can have a, a knowledge contribution. So the careful evaluation uh, helps us to to uh, so that what well, um, yeah that helps us to to produ produce new results. And the new results need to be combined with the old results. So that is why we we move this from the background into uh, what I call the related work. And then we compare our evaluation with the existing knowledge and that together becomes your thesis. And then the thesis becomes part of the background for other students' work. So that is sort of the, the scientific work and how that is done. If we miss one part of this, um, then we don't have a thesis. So the the background of your thesis is not only to provide an overview of the area it should provide this research gap we need to present the research gap and that means that if we're looking into something specific some specific area we need to have know who has done what in that area and uh, some students want to develop something. Perhaps they want to develop some web app or they want to develop some kind of um, new thing. And in order to do that, they need to understand what things are already existing here. What are the current solutions to the problem or the knowledge gap or the um, what, what, what is the current knowledge right now? Otherwise, there might just you know follow someone else's steps, and that is not providing any new knowledge. Okay, questions on this? Uh, hi, uh, this hi. about this um, uh, web development that you said, for instance, you said this, mm -hmm. uh, but how is it possible to make an? Because I mean, if we want to make a web uh, development web app or something there mm. are some definitely similar exist so yeah if you want to develop something then it should have some new feature that never exists before or how could it be like yeah so so perhaps you see i, I mean there are different ways of this so perhaps we are solving a problem and a new um new 
um, application area problem with with uh, computer science already known technologies, but we are applying computer science onto a new problem. So sometimes we have a new industry, uh, many in new industry where where computer science have not been applied. So for instance, with um, uh, blockchain technology that was you know the last few years we have had a lot of bachelor theses where students have uh, applied blockchain technology onto something new and then they have evaluated how good or bad was this i'm i'm going to use this good or bad but that that is the careful evaluation of their you know implementation of their new design they are applying computer science in a new way, so so to speak, and then they're evaluating that. And then they say that, okay, for this area, uh, uh, computer science or blockchain technology was good in this way and bad in this way. Um, it could also be that you have an idea within computer science. So um, that you, for instance, you've heard about some kind of algorithm and you have your own idea for an algorithm. So we had a, a thesis where um, the student was interested in game development and was thinking about how can I generate these really really cool uh, landscapes that we can have, you know, for our uh, for our levels or in the background of our levels. And uh, she wanted to try if she could use. Um, um, machine learning instead to speed up the process of generating these uh, cool landscape. It was not only generating the landscape itself, it was also generating it with erosion. So she was comparing the, um, you know, the erosion normal algorithm with machine learning. Yes, so we can, we have a question from Henry. Yeah, just uh, regarding this, uh, to what extent do you mean when, when it's like, not been done before because I've seen several examples of what you just explained. One of these, uh, the machine learning for different uh, terrain generations and yeah. erosion stuff. Like I've seen it since the past years, if I'm honest. And then yeah. one of one of my biggest problem is to come up with something that is unique. I don't feel like there is anything really unique. For example, I've been working a lot with web components. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing would to be applied web components because it's an isolated component right and then you yep. could apply it to blockchain and then you can make sure that you have the security that it, there is no other developers that can inject mm. malicious code for example yeah but is that is that really original because blockchain we have done extensive work on there we have done extensive work on the web component we have done yep. extensive work on the security aspects mm. so either the thing that we are you know developing is is new in some way or we apply it in a new way or to a new area or the evaluation method is a bit different than previous evaluations for this area so so we can have we can have the same problem as someone else, and then we evaluate it in a new way. So for instance, uh, and sometimes it's even a knowledge con contribution if we evaluate it in the same way, but with the, with something different. So so when we, I did a study where we talked about uh, the quality of code to, um, pro to programmers. And we uh, did um, a, a starting study where we um, interviewed a number of programmers. I think it was like 20 programmers or something like that. Um, and this study is not complete because 20 programmers are not every programmer, right? So so we could have another study where they, they uh, select some other kinds of programmers because we, we um, uh, talked about or, or we presented not only uh, the programmers, but also, you know, their their categories from which country they came from, what the sex they have, what kind of education they have, uh, what kind of, you know, knowledge. And perhaps there is a knowledge contribution uh, that you can do with, you know, asking different kinds of people or evaluating it in a different way. So if you look at any computer science study, you can see that every study has its drawbacks. So you can look at one study and you can say that they have done this but they have missed this kind of evaluations. That is what I'm going to do. Okay, so John has raised his hand. 
Uh, yes, could you give me some quick examples on the uh, evaluation methods? I'm not quite sure what it is. Okay, so uh, an evaluation method could, for instance, be uh, um, an experiment. So in an experiment, we, yeah, I mean, experiments can be done in many ways, but we can uh, perhaps, so I, I did a tool for learning programming, for instance. So we could measure the level of programming knowledge for students before using the tool and then we let the students use the tool to learn programming and then we measure the programming experience after using the tool uh, so and then we compare these uh, and perhaps we have another group that is used just using a book to learning programming and that is our comparison group so we could do a computer science experiment it could also be um that you do interviews like i mentioned so we talk to people and find out what they're what they are thinking what they are uh, what their experiences are uh we could also do surveys where we we send out a form for uh with questions to many people um we could have a design study uh which is where you if you if you find something okay this i want i want to create a prototype of this thing and then you do a design study instead and that can be evaluated in in many different ways but you're then you're creating something new you're programming something new uh, and then you evaluate that something and that could be by showing it to experts you could have you know um user studies you can have usability studies depends on, i mean depends what kind of evaluation you do depends on what kind of information you want uh, in order to uh, to say something about your um, the thing that you're evaluating yes uh, is an evaluation method too if i have a, a scientific question and i answer it on the basis of other scientific papers i find okay yeah so there are uh, okay. these called secondary studies a secondary study, uh, for instance, could be a literature review study. And we're going to look at one of those uh, during the first uh, workshop. Uh, so you're going to get a bit of experience on that particular thing because it's quite good because you're going to look at many different studies. So it's good to be systematic in your searching, which aligns with that. Yes, so secondary studies can be done. But we need to make sure that there is room for such a secondary study. And during that workshop, we're going to look deeper into this. Uh, so secondary study is where we use primary studies, which are, you know, papers or theses that other have produced. And then you, you produce a, a meta study on top of those. Um, yes. Okay. Any more questions on this slide or I continue? Thank you for your questions. So, okay, so uh, the communication strategy. So uh, first thing in the communication strategy is that we have a course homepage. So this is the link to the course homepage. There is in Slack a link in the top uh, under the headline of the uh, 2DV50E channel um, where this link is also. So that um course homepage is for static information so if i have something static i'm gonna put it there um there i have not really updated it much we uh had some problem during the spring with with this uh homepage and i really didn't have time to uh to update it so it's a bit behind so think about slack as your primary channel for information and communication channel so the course homepage, I mean, it contains a lot of different kinds of information uh, about the course and different uh, methodologies and course content and some recordings, uh, more or less lectures on some of these methodologies. But much of this course is outside of the course content. So for instance, if you're going to do interviews, you need to find a, a good source of how to do interviews. If you're going to do surveys, you need to find a good source on how to do surveys. If you're going to do uh, experiments, of course, you're going to need to read up on how to do experiments and stuff like that, right? Um, yes. Then the second part of the communication channel is the dynamic part. And I think this one is the most important one. So we in Slack, we have this channel 2DV50E, and it's going to be used by me and you to communicate uh, throughout the course. 
So this is the place where you're going to ask questions. This is where uh, I'm going to inform you about, you know, different deadlines and how to hand in stuff. Uh, I'm going to post links here to different things. Uh, supervisors may also, you know, post things here. Um, we can have discussions on how to do different things here. Uh, and everything that is super important, I'm going to pin that. So below this, you can see that there are a lot of pinned items already in, in Slack. And you, uh, because this course has been run for many years. And um, so you can read all the pinned items, at least all the pinned items uh, from the course start and later. Um, I usually... Uh, yeah, the, there is a link to the course homepage. I'm not sure if I put up a 2023 schedule yet, but um, I usually put a schedule link also on this one. So what I want you to do is that I want you to react on all pinned posts. And I want you to do that because then I feel that I'm communicating to someone. I can see that you have participated in the information. So I think that every information that I post as a pin post, I count that you have read it. Uh, and you react with it with, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, smiling face, whatever you, or not smiling face, uh, whatever you think. Uh, but to me, then it tells me that, okay, I've reached, you know, 50% of the class or so. And if other students are asking questions, I want you also to, uh, you know, react to those. And we're trying to be positive. We're trying to not just positive. We try to, to be, you know, helpful. Uh, when someone asks a question, put a thumbs up or, you know, uh, a, a pointy finger uh, if you also want the answer to that question. If you already know the answer to the question, try to answer it yourself. Um, if a question has been fully answered and you've got your answer, put a check mark on that, uh, that post so that I can see that this one has already been answered. Sometimes when I answer a question and I think that I've answered it, I put a check mark, mark on it. it. Doesn't You can still continue to ask follow-up questions if you didn't understand my answer, right? But I try to use um, check marks. Later in the course, in a month, you're going to have a supervisor. Uh, and a big part of the communication strategy is to communicate with your supervisor also. And supervisors are different. So we have, I think, six or so uh, that are going to supervise this autumn. And they may prefer different ways of communicating. So some supervisors may sit in Vecchio and they might want you to come to their office or they want might, might want to book a room or some wants to be communicated by email, some on Slack. And you may also have, you know, com communication preferences. So um, some might sit here in, in Kalmar, and then perhaps if you're in Växjö, maybe you want to travel here at one point, or uh, you just want to have Zoom calls with these. So this needs to be negotiated. So it's not going to be a ready-made solution for you. This is the way that we communicate. There is going to be a communication between you and the supervisor. And you need to take responsibility on that this happens in a good way. So one super big risk for every thesis is that the students and the supervisors are not communicating. Um, so perhaps I've, I've seen supervisors say that, oh, the students have not sent anything uh, to me for three months. And that is problematic uh, because then I know that these students, either they have not worked during these three months or they have worked on their own and not gotten any supervision during this time it could be you know could be the fault of the student or the fault of the supervisor but really this is communication so you need to make sure that you get supervision uh so, uh, so you need to agree on how to communicate and when to meet and how to meet and when to deliver stuff and how to deliver stuff in what format the, the supervisors wants stuff. So some for, some students, uh, some have a supervisor wants, you know, a Google Drive document. Some wants a LaTeX document. Uh, some might want, you know, I want to read it 
my um, my own uh, examiner said to me, I just want to read your thesis once. So don't send it to me too early. And then I got, oh my God. Um, but I think that is probably um, not super good thing. I think it's good that that you have a shared document together. Uh, but this can this can differ between different uh, theses on how you do that. And if you don't negotiate with the supervisor and you don't tell them what you need and what you want, and they don't tell you what, then you have not done this, right? So this is the responsibility of you and partly shared with them. But you, no one can you know, blame the supervisor only. Uh, sometimes you can, but then you should go to me. Okay. Um, so you need to take responsibility. Try to make the most out of each delivery. So if you deliver something, if you have a meeting with your supervisors, make sure that you are prepared and you have questions. You have, if you're delivering something to the supervisor, make sure that it's readable, that it they can, you know, answer your questions using this. Um, um so, and this is actually a big, big risk because I tried to be a good supervisor, but I had a student that sent me text and I didn't understand it because the language in it was not that good. And this was a super big risk because we spent weeks and weeks, but misunderstanding each other. And that meant that the student was working on another problem than I thought the student was working. And we didn't really communicate. And one part of the problem was that the student, you know, had some writing problems. Uh, and the student also, you know, uh, agreed to everything I said on the meetings, which I thought was, okay, we are working with this problem. So this is actually quite hard. So don't just, you know... Um, nod and say yes to everything the supervisors say. If you don't understand what they say, make sure to take control of this situation. And then you ask, okay, what did you mean with this? What do you mean with this kind of methodology? Uh, where can I find this? Um, and then they can, you know, so that you, you know, you don't feel ashamed that you don't know things. It's normal for students to not know things. You're supposed to learn things here, right? Okay, uh, follow convention, make sure that it looks like a thesis. So there is a template uh, and I'm gonna post a link to that in Slack also so that you have uh, that. There is a timeline uh, for the course. And I think that you don't see the timeline. You're still seeing the slides, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so I need to swap to the timeline. And we share that one instead. So now you see the timeline, right? Yep. Oh, awesome. So this is a preliminary timeline. So um, actually, I've not put the, I've not looked in the calendar to, to make sure that these dates are, but I've put time slots, so, so to speak. Um, so now in the beginning with the workshop and stuff like that, most of those are in schedule. And then I've put dates here and deadlines. But I'm not looked at like, is this a Sunday or is this, you know, in the middle of the week? I've not looked at, at that level. So maybe we need to, you know, move these deadlines a little bit. Uh, but we are a small class. There are nine students uh, that can be registered on the course. So if we need to, to move things a little bit, it's not going to be a big move. It might be a day or two. I try to always be favorable for the student. That means more time than, than it says here. But I need you to communicate to me also on what your needs are. So you can say that, oh, we have an exam on this date. Uh, could we have this a week earlier or, you know, uh, two days later or something like that? Uh, but this uh, is generally the... Um, you know, the timeline for the process. You can see that there are many different steps and I've set responsible an action for who does what, and then a deadline for when it should be done. And then who should receive the, you know, the, the, the result of the action, so to speak. So I'm doing the course introduction today, according to the schedule, and you are the recipient of this. And then we're going to have a workshop on the research area according to the schedule, and you are the recipient. And then we're going to have individual SPP tutoring at some point. It should also be a position in the uh, schedule. 
and you are supposed to study course material and you know find articles and stuff like that for your background as part of after a research area i mean you can start today if you want to uh, and then you're supposed to find a gap but you're only you know communicating with yourself but also when we have the second workshop i mean we can have some talk about that um at some point you are going to have here is the first deadline which is more or less in a month so 30th uh, September and here you need to have produced something I call it a student project proposal or the SPP which is uh, the first part of the thesis but in a separate document so that we can have a little more uh, project-based questions to you and in a little bit different language than you have when you're presenting a thesis because the thesis is the the end project of your work but the SPP is um, trying to answer the question is this a good project or not and try to guide you to good to better projects I'm gonna uh, give you a link to the SPP today so don't worry about that um, and then from the SPP when we have a student project uh, proposal, when we can, that is sort of a communication on what you intend to do and what you want to do and what you intend to do a little bit on how to do it also. At that point, we can say this project can be done or this project cannot be done. So you have a hand in and that, that, therefore we have this, uh, this deadline. So I'm gonna look at this SPPs and the supervisors advisors are also going to look at these SPPs and then you're going to get feedback on these SPPs and uh, sometimes if the if we cannot see a knowledge gap in these if we cannot see a background we cannot see a knowledge gap we cannot see a possible knowledge contribution we don't think that or we don't think that this is something that can be done during a thesis period then you need to change stuff so we have a second deadline for that also there is an updated uh, deadline um, two weeks later. Uh, hopefully, you should have you know um, some some feedback back to the students so that you have uh, that. But if everything looks lo okay in this SPP, normally things need to change a little bit, right? Uh, then we assign a supervisor and we assign an examiner, and then you work with this. So we have uh, this one: student and supervisor uh, joint responsible to make contact and plan supervision for the rest of the semester. Um, and I think that a good idea is that you have, you have weekly meetings with your supervisor and you, know, you are working together with this project. At some point, we need to make sure that this is a good project. So we need to reconnect with the person that is supposed to grade this project. So, but I want that to be done when you have worked with your supervisor. So first step, you work alone or in pairs for your SPP. Then you work together with your uh, supervisor uh, in order to make sure that everything looks all, all right, right? So you get some feedback and then we approach the examiner and ask, is this a reasonable project to the examiner? Can you, in the end, if we do this, can you put a passing grade on this? So I call that the methodology of workshop. And this is, you can see that uh, it's responsibility for students, supervisors, and examiner, because you need to find a time slot that is suitable for all, all three of you. At that point, during the methodology workshop, it's really a presentation where you quite quickly present your project to the examiner. And then the examiner might say that, oh, I think that perhaps this kind of methodology is not suitable for this. Maybe you should change it to this other kind of methodology. Perhaps an experiment is better for this or um, something else. Maybe you can adjust your knowledge contribution a little bit in this angle. Uh, so I think this is super important to... <laughs> I'm going to call it make a good impression here, but it's not really like a sale... It's a little bit like a sales pitch, but the important thing is, is this a good suitable project to do uh, a thesis on? Uh, it's quite easy to, to fool the examiner and to fool the supervisor and to fool oneself that this is a good project. So in order to not, yeah, so, so it could be, um, it sounds good. If it's things that sound good, uh, but they, there might be some 
some some big problem. We're, I'm going to talk a bit about pitfalls or problems a bit later, but uh, don't try to you know pass this thing. It's not the methodology workshop. You you want if there is a problem, you want them to tell you about the problem. So you need to show them as you know carefully as possible that uh, what you intend to do, so that they can find all the problems with it. Does it make sense? Do you understand? Um, not quite, because even if um, the results of my bachelor thesis are bad, so mm. the, the result would be that the project is not, um, you cannot do what I wanted to do. You cannot um, mm. program a plugin for Chrome that does this and that, then it would yeah. be okay. It would be scientifically okay, wouldn't it? Yeah. So yes, yes. So sometimes it is like this, but but um, at this point, if you know, if we have some technical issue, that I, I would call that a risk, right? So we have a risk, and uh, a risk needs to be mediated. So part of the SPP is to try to identify different kinds of risks. Can I do this? Uh, um, yeah, can it be done? Do we have the resources for this? Do we uh, have the you know the computers or the uh, technologies available for this. So that, that it's all or all a part of the SPP. But if you have a plan, a good plan, um, at the point of the methodology workshop, you should be feel quite confident that this can be done, and hopefully the examiner you know helps you in this. Um, you don't need to produce, you know, a successful. Um, well, how am I going to express this? Um, if you do an experiment and you say that I've created this plugin and then we uh, use this plugin and, and with a user group and we study if it helps them or not. Um, so the careful evaluation is about you know how helpful this is. And we compare it to not having a plugin but having a book, for instance. Your plug, you, I mean... Um, and then you do an experiment where some people get the plugin and some get the book. The plugin does not need to be successful in helping them, but your evaluation should be carefully done. It should be scientifically done, right? Did it make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yes, yes. So in the in December, so now you've been working with your supervisor, you presented it to the examiner. The examiner said that, yes, this sounds like a project like I, uh, that I can put uh, my money on. Um, we might have uh, a peer review together. So we try to help each other to produce better, better uh, thesis texts. Uh, I put that in you know, late uh, November, beginning of December. But in the in December, you're gonna hand over your thesis to your supervisor and say that okay, this is you know 80, 90 percent ready thesis. I just need to you know finish up these parts, you know, uh, conclude this thing. But it's all everything is in this thesis. So the supervisor should be able to, from that hand in to say that you are ready to present, or you need to you know do more stuff before you can present. Uh, so, uh, and this is quite important because if you present, that means that you're putting your work on uh, up for examination. And if you put your work up for examination, you can get a pa passing grade, but you can also get a failing grade. If you get a failing grade on this, you need to do a new thesis. And we don't want that. So um, it's actually your, um, you have the right to get your this is presented, but I would not recommend it unless your supervisor also says that this can be presented because we don't want to lose your work. Um, so we're going to be a bit harsh on that, but uh, it's all for your sake, so so to speak. Um, when I have when I know who can present, I'm going to assign opponents on your thesis, and then there are going to be presentations in January. Uh, so you're going to present your work and you're going to be the opponent of someone else's work. And that means that you're going to read some other students' work and you're going to critically uh, evaluate that work and see what kind of problems can you find with their scientific method. Um, you're actually helping them to improve their thesis also. 
After that, the the version that was sent to the opponent is also the version that the examiner puts the grade on. So um, the examiner reads that and should give you feedback in January. Uh, sometimes some examiners have, you know, uh, mountains of work at this study period. I'm one of those because I have a, a big course with many students. Uh, so they might say that we need to delay this, this deadline a, a little bit because I have this other things that I also need to do. Uh, so many of the, the deadlines here are not super strict. They are, you know, negotiable, but the presentation is a date in the calendar when everyone is going to present that cannot really be negotiated. So I think this deadline can be negotiated, but, but the supervisors deadline to me cannot be negotiated because I'm going to assign opponents. So if someone hands in a presentation after I've assigned opponents to the other students, then that, that doesn't work. Um, so the examiner uh, submits feedback. The student is changing um, final changes according to the feedback. And uh, then we have a plagiarism check and then we are uh, putting a grade in uh, LODOC. And, you know, um, yeah, the examiner puts a, a grade, grade in lot of, or puts a grade in, but we need to check the plagiarism check. Um, there might be the cases where the examiner needs more changes. Uh, so uh, if you're not approved, there might be, you know, the, the examiner says that I cannot put a, a passing grade on this. The students need to put in more work in this or, you know, they need to do two more interviews because this is too little material or whatever. Um, so I think that make sure that you get the big work done before. Uh, finally, your work is published in a, a database called Diva, uh, which is the um, university's database. Okay, that was the timeline. Now you see the presentation again with the spring 2023 preliminary timeline, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, essentially, there is a process, the same thing that I've told you about as process document. I don't think that we need to go through it again. Um, yes. Okay, so the first thing that I want you to, to do now is that you need to find a topic. And the topic is not a thesis in details. A topic is, you know, what kind of areas within computer science are you interested in? And what sub areas of those areas are you more interested in? So, um, I mean, doesn't always need to be from interest. It could also be that, you know, you have some, um, um, some company that you have contacted uh, and they need something that the, the, to be done. Uh, it could be that one of the supervisors or some other researchers here on LNU want some research, you know, looked into. Perhaps they have a research suggestion for you. Uh, it could be something that you see it would be good for society if we do this. It could be something that is super hot right now. Yes, Henry. Uh, just super quick for the company part. Uh, so I'm currently working for a consulting company. So I'm working with several different companies. And I wonder like, how would, how, how could I apply like a, a thesis based on a project for a company? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't okay. feel like that is contributing anything new in the end. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing is like, it's always like application development on the, on the, the mm -hmm. Browser level is, is the same things. It's login screens, it's, it's tables, yeah. it's different things, but it's nothing new, yeah. Okay, so I think that there are, might be really good opportunities here. So you've heard about software engineering, right? Mm. Soft, software engineering is the engineering type of doing these app, uh, apps, right? So perhaps we can do um, a study where we look at this company and we look and, and how they develop uh, their apps. And we look at some, perhaps some part of the process, and we investigate that part of the process 
uh, perhaps an improvement of that process or how they do it right now. So we can do, um, just need to check, um, because the word is not coming to me. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, a case study where you, you look into their specific case and you investigate that as the software engineering uh, researcher. So for instance, uh, we've had um, students that look into um, so we had I had a student that looked into the medical industry and and how they uh, make sure that the the programs are actually doing what they're supposed to do because it's quite important when it's you know uh, when it's people involved and it's sensitive information in the system and I think even the the system was giving advice to doctors it's quite important that giving the right kind of advice um so um so the, the student was looking into how they did this within this company. And then he compared that to the state of the art research right now. So, um, okay. and the result of that would be that we get a case study for other computer science researchers or software engineer researchers that they comp can compare with perhaps other industries like the, the train industry or other places where they have this kind of thing. So they we can learn from different applications of computer science, yes. Okay, so um, just a follow up then. Um, just to play with the idea, uh, one thing I'm I'm always seeing is a huge problem within multiple different companies is the the lack of communication between back end and design. Yeah. Uh, because there's always the front end is, is looking at the design and then looking at the back end. Back end is just looking at the requirement that usually uh, POs are setting. Yeah, but they are never considering the actual design. In, in the end, it always results in that the back end is having some solution, design mm -hmm. is having another solution, and front end just needs has like the front end is like super much work on the front end, which is such an unnecessary process. If only the back end were to like look more closely on, on design, would that be a, like an interesting topic? Yeah. So in order to answer that question, we need to understand the current knowledge on this. So I think, yeah, to me, it sounds like an interesting project, but it's because I have not read the studies on it. So, but this is a good starting point. You have a question. Is this a good project? Yeah. And then I say, okay, yes, if you can find a knowledge gap there. So you need to find studies that look into this, you know, this lack of communication between these two things which sounds like it might exist. And you then you try to find what exists today, what they, they what were their results today? Because if you, you know, imagine your own study right now without knowledge of that background, you might do something that is completely unreasonable. But if you know what they have done, you can do something similar, but perhaps evaluate it a little bit different, or you can do something that, that builds on top of their work, which makes sense. So let's say that a company has tried to uh, put these people in the same room and let them, you know, fight it out like fight club style. And then they did interviews after that. And then they measured, you know, their um, satisfaction with their work before and after doing this, something like that. Then you don't need to do this. Always hard to give examples in this. Let's see. But I think you see a problem right now, which is really, really good. But you need to find out what are the current solutions to that problem, which is read up on this. OK. OK, there is a list of project proposals on the course homepage. And I think that is going to be removed because it's all old information. There is a spreadsheet on um, on Slack um, in, below the headline uh, on Slack, and I think my, many projects there might also be old. A, a problem with the autumn start of this uh, this course is that the sort of main course of, of this starts in the spring. So most supervisors think spring project. But I think a good approach would be to approach 
uh, employees at Linnaeus universities, preferably those that does research and ask, do you have an idea for a research project for me? Um, there might still be some projects that are not taken previous years, uh, but I've not updated this. I Actually, you know, I'm the course responsible. So if someone sends me a project, I'm going to put it um, in here. Uh, but no one has sent me a project over the summer, so that I know of. Okay, so we can have different, you know, ways into this. Uh, but in the end, we want to find a topic. But a good idea to start with thinking, what do I like? What kind of courses do I, did I like? Within those courses, where there's something particular that I like. So, and this is, you know, a research area is something bigger area of computer science within your, you know, um which in your education so if you're taking my course in testing so testing could be a is a part of computer science and then within testing we can have you know automated unit test a part of that and then within automated unit test perhaps we could have uh unit tests generated by large language models which is a part of automated uh, unit tests uh so this is you know narrowing down a research area uh, the research area is something that I now define as a research area is always within computer science. So you need to make sure that it is within computer science. So how do we know? Yeah, we need to know what computer science is in order to know what, what, what this is. So we're going to have a short break. And I'm going to post this in the chat. And I want you to, you know, just scroll through this page and then write in the chat during the break things that you've encountered during your education. And we want you to be sort of not beginners within the part within the research area that you go into in your bachelor thesis. You should, you know, build on top of knowledge you've already gotten in your courses. So if you're, you know, um have done a lot of co courses in computer uh, security perhaps that is a re suitable research area if you've done a lot of programming perhaps you should do programming also in your bachelor thesis but now just go through the wikipedia page scroll a little bit uh, through that just to you know freshen up a little bit what computer science is and how to um uh, what it can be so just you know put stuff here like software testing was my stuff <laughs> yeah okay so i think that we're gonna have uh 12 minutes is enough right for getting uh, a bit of coffee and stuff like that so see you in 12 minutes um uh, ways of generating automatically generating unit tests and we can dive even deeper and become even more specific. So we can say that what is the accuracy of ChatGPT uh, version 3.5 compared to number four, uh, for version four, when it comes to accuracy of large language models uh, generated tests. And we can go even deeper and say that, oh, let's look into a specific application area of this. Let's look at web applications and JavaScript. And then we, you know, we're becoming more and more narrow. Yes, Henry. Just an interesting thing, because I've been developing uh, automatic unit testing using the chat GPT models. Yeah. Uh, however, I've seen that some companies are having this policy because there is like the security aspects of one interesting thing I would say is actually how can you use, because I would say it's more and more being used throughout uh, what I've been seeing, that like is automated uh, test cases generated. Mm -hmm. But then that would mean that you would have to up uh, like upload the code and then the sensitive information can be stolen and companies don't want the code to be accessed. So that would be actually, because there's the private CCP stuff as well, but they are not so good. So yeah, just for other people, that would be a very interesting one. Yeah. And I mean, uh, this could be something that we can look into. How willing are different companies? How trusting are they with um, um, OpenAI, for instance? Or um, how do they reason? Maybe this is something that we can talk about, you know, um, about programmers in general. How willing are they to 
to trust these tests or to trust these technologies or the the um, and then we can survey that. So all that could be interesting from uh, a computer science perspective also. Um, but in order to find out if that is something that we should do, then we need to look at who has done this before. So when it comes to um, generating unit tests with large language models, I have supervised students working on this. I know that there have been works done before. So for instance, um, I think this student worked in Java or JavaScript. I don't remember. It was this spring, uh, but I don't remember. So you could do sort of the same thing, but with another language. And that would be something new, right? So you would evaluate something new. You could have more or less um, the same um, question, but you're, up, you're uh, changing something in um in how this experiment is done and then you find out new information but you you sh need to know what this other student had done before you in order to 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 be able to do that in a good way yes okay so um i think a really good idea right now would be to explore uh, computer science but um okay henry i'm sorry i just uh, because of the, the last thing you just said how, if, if you want me to, to do a scientific research on something that is unknown, but you require that someone has already done it before, mm. doesn't yeah. that kind of contradict the whole part? I get it for a bachelor thesis, mm. it, it, because the bachelor needs to be a little bit safe, because maybe that's why, but would you not like cases where, where you, you find a problem, but no one has ever looked into it? Like That, that would be a very interesting, you know? Yeah. But okay, so so let me talk about uh, a, a problem that that I supervised and what happened. So I had this idea that I want to be able to generate. This was uh, before ChatGPT, but I wanted to be, to be able to generate uh, questions, programming questions for students, programming problems for students, so that um, Henry would not get the same uh, problem as Muhammad and John would get his own problem, right? Uh, and we, we, I wanted to explore this gen automatic generation of programming problems. And uh, the student, you know, looked into it a bit uh, and then um, started doing a, a, a generative model for this, not using ChatGPT and stuff like that. He did another kind of technology but this student never um or not until lately in the project uh found out that there existed this programming uh, problem generators already and that meant that we needed to change the the way that the student did things late in the project so the earlier you find out what other people have done the better so you can explore a new project yes so no one has done this before, but you need to show that no one has done this before. So you need to do the searches and find nothing. But we should not do the searches badly and find nothing um, because then we have, we don't know still. And in this case, the student did, I think, probably a good job searching, but you know this is not easy to find everything. There are different vocabularies from the beginning. We didn't know the uh, automa automatic uh, uh, programming problem generation uh, acronym, so we didn't search for that and, and stuff like that. Um, so it's not easy, but we try to do the best we can. Okay, so uh, I've talked about research area and application areas before, but let's define these a bit more carefully because I think this can reduce the confusion both for you and for your examiners. So computer science is an applied science. Almost every other uh, science and almost every other area in society is using computer science to, to apply the computer science, right? So health, banking, automotive, research, biology, and all these other things, all these other things are outside of computer science, even if they use computer science. So we call those application areas instead of research areas. Biology is a research area, but in biology, 
right? So if you're looking, um, you know, in um, the um, ultrasonic uh, sounds made by bats, then that is, if you're, you know, investigating how how different kinds of bats sound, um, you are probably going to use computer science, but you are not um, researching computer science. You're researching bats, right? So uh, you need to make sure that uh, you're doing a computer science research area, that your, your, your knowledge contribution is within computer science. So for instance, students that, um, that I have worked with did work with the biology department, but they did look at on how to store um, bat sounds uh, and different algorithms for storing bat sounds because the compression algorithms that are used for sounds today are, does not suit uh, ultrasonic sounds. Um, so uh, since the, the bats sound ultrasonic, those frequencies are generally cut out. So what they did was, okay, we examine all of these sound formats. Do we need to create our own sound formats or should we uh, only uh, use raw formats in here? Yeah, so they they were looking into the, to the computer science problems of you know how to create a new uh, sound format, but for the biology application area. Um, so computer science is a broad field of research. We have much of the cool stuff that we all love: the machine learning, web development, programming languages, security, computer vision, networks, computer science education. All of those things are research areas, but. If you get a company that wants you to do something, you're, they want you to program an app, it's probably that they want you to work with an application area. And then you should say that, okay, yeah, we could develop this app, but we need to find a computer science research area problem within this. So when you talked about the app development, then I tried to find something that is computer science, software engineering research. And when you're talking about this um, front end background pro problem, then we're approaching that because that is you know, computer science. Um, a bachelor thesis often has both application areas and research areas. So, so if you're doing something in the automotive uh, industry, perhaps with self-driving cars or cars or something like that, uh, you're working with Saab or Volvo or um, Mercedes or something like that, uh, then your um, your application area is the automotive industry, and that changes how what kind of uh, computer science. Um, uh, areas you are applying to that other area. So a bachelor thesis need to describe the problem area, which might be, you know, in, in applied, uh, but we need to do a computer science uh, knowledge contribution. Some other computer scientists should find your uh, research interesting. They should find out something new. It could be that you have uh, you know, done this experiment and they they can read your your measurements from the experiment. So a bachelor thesis often has both, but must have a knowledge contribution within a computer science research area project. So I think a, a big the a big idea with with uh, the SPP uh, is that um, to to find these areas, right? So, they are often, you know, a bit entwined together, uh, and it could be sometimes a bit hard to to find out what is what. And I'm going to show you during the first work, uh, the first workshop, uh, on how they can, you know, be a bit entwined. And uh, I'm going to show you a borderline case for a student that still passed, uh, but uh, was, you know, close to the edge of computer science and. Uh, application area. So we're going to discuss that uh, during the first workshop. Um, so every thesis needs a background. And a background is the description of the application area. And we motivate why we want to do this. And then we uh, also introduce the computer science research area. We start from general things to more specific areas. So when I was giving this, um, this line in the chat where I had software testing, and then sub area of that was automated unit testing and sub area of that was automatic generation of unit tests and sub area of that was automated unit test with large language models and sub area of that was the accuracy of LLM generated tests. Then I'm doing a funnel, uh, which is on the, the picture here. Uh, so we're starting from something generic 
computer science more or less. And then we're going to more and more specific area. And when we are on the point, the end, the, you know, the accuracy of large language model uh, generated tests, then we hopefully only have a handful of other uh, computer science studies that are within the same uh, area. And we call that the related work. So the related work are on the pointy end of your research area funnel. Uh, this is super important to do this good because your examiner might not be an expert in your area, but you should show that you are an expert in the area. And this is how you show it. And this is how you show the knowledge gap. So you are going to you know, give an overview so any computer scientist can read your work and understand it. And, you know, uh, and then they get to the pointy end. And then you get a description of all the super important related work, the, uh, the competition, the, the other people who have also worked with the accuracy of large language models. Uh, and then you present the gap also say that, okay, they have worked with Java and these have worked with JavaScript, but no one has been working with C++ when it comes to this, something like that. And so my knowledge contribution is to work with C++ and investigate the accuracy. And we are going to compare um, different kinds of large language um, models. Okay. So finding a research area is the topic of work workshop one. So I want you to start already today with, you know, that that's why I wanted you to look at the Wikipedia page to, to look into these things that we've already done on in different courses, go through those and then look into within Henry Paps, you wrote peer programming. So um, within peer, peer programming, uh, is there something else that you are interested in? Uh, within, you know, database graph solutions, within that area, what kind of database graph solutions are you more interested in? What is the, the cutting edge here? Um, really, we want to um, find a research area that's suitable for your program for profile. You should already be somewhat an expert within this research area. You should have taken courses, right? Um, it should have research potential, which means that other studies, your related work should be fairly recent. If you only find studies from the 60s and no one has looked into this area since then, there might be sort of a dead area and that the um, there might not be a target group for your thesis. Who should read your thesis? If you find you know newly produced um, research within your um, within the research area, then there is an ongoing discussion in within the computer science world. I think that it's super important that it's meaningful for you. You're gonna, you know, work on this for weeks and hours and hours. So if it's not meaningful for you, if you don't find it at least be interesting, then choose another research area, please. Um, yes. And then number four, development work in computer science. So if you are um, if you're developing something, make sure that you're developing something that can be evaluated by a computer science in a computer science way. So uh, that you're not doing another um, web application that has been done. All the steps of it have been done before, and we are not able to carefully evaluate it in a way that we can, you know, give knowledge to another uh, computer scientist on on something that it was not already known. Um, we can, you know, sometimes um, we can compare different technologies. So many studies are so-called comparison studies. So we, we compare the old way of doing things with the new way of doing things, and then we evaluate those in some different aspects or so. Yes. So practice is to the first workshop, find the research paper that is closest within computer science, that is closest to what you would like to have done, I would say, instead of to intend to do. So what you have liked to be done. So I call this the research twin. So the closest thing to what you wanna do. And if you find that you have some idea, so we've already heard a couple of, of nice ideas uh, and I much uh, enjoyed that you brought those up already. So um, if you find out that someone has already done this, let's say this exact thing that you had your idea, then that is a really good find because then this is prob probably 
a related work for you. And these related works are, you know, um, really, really valuable. You can, I can, I can say more or less guarantee you, unless you find some, some area which is, has been, you know, there are thousands of papers or, you know, there are hundreds of papers within the specific thing, then we need to dive into deeper into, <laughs> into some sub area of that area in order to be able to succeed, in order to be able to cover that. But if you find that, find out that someone has done something, within your idea, then yes, celebrate. That, that is a good find because then you're gonna stand on the top of that study and you're gonna have that as related work. That finding that study is validation that you have fought something that someone else has fought before, which is really good. So don't just swap area because someone else has already done this. And does that make sense? Yes. So I spent a lot of time, you know, developing a tool for uh, evaluating test cases. And I didn't understand what I just told you. Uh, so I, when I've already done the tool, I tried it on different uh, different um, um, projects. And I came up with some conclusion. I wrote the paper. And then when I wrote the paper, I looked in the background and found, oh, someone has wrote another tool for this. They have another vocabulary for my original idea. And then I just scrapped my work. Okay, I'm gonna do something else for my research, which was really stupid. And I I wished my supervisor had told me that, oh, no, this is a good thing that you found this. Now you can compare yourself with this person. You can say that they have this tool and you have your tool. And we compare these tools on, on the same projects and see how they differ. What tool is best? What tool is worst? Might be that their tool is better, but that that is a good find. That also, right? Um, maybe uh, there are cases where one tool is better than the other tool, and we find that, and that is a knowledge contribution. So don't just skip away from something because you find that they have already done it. People have done many areas, and I can guarantee you, if you find something, we can find something that can build on top of that. Okay. Mm, yes, so the knowledge contribution should be relevant not only to you. So you should be able to imagine some kind of audience that wants you to produce this knowledge. So uh, if it's, um, uh, it, it, that this means that you need to motivate why your work is important. So if you're doing another web application, in a known way that has been tried many times before. And we don't find anything that is exciting and we don't find anything that is, you know, new in this. You're not using something new. You're not comparing anything that has not been compared before. Then no one wants to read that. And you don't, you don't want to do it either. It's not exciting. So it should be, you should have a, a little bit of excitement and think, okay, what, uh, what is the answer to this? Um, so that is the research gap. It could be motivated by computer science research, but it could also be that we are applying something at computer science and we motivate our work because it's usable. It's of use to society. So something that concerns me right now is the you know upcoming elections and the use of large language models to manipulate large populations. So maybe we could you know do stuff in order to do to let, let people be you know better prepared for this I, I have no idea it's just you know my idea for for something that could be of use of society perhaps we could have some plugin in the browser that helps us to identify you know these kind of new uh, bots that um, within social media or something like that. I have no idea um if our results are super narrow um, that they cannot be applied in, in some other context, um, then uh, it might not be useful for anyone else, right? So if I have, I do an experiment within a company with only their things and no one else has access to these tools, then this uh, experiment is only usable for this particular company. And that is too small to be, uh, you know, generalizable and interesting to other people, unless we, you know, we uh, try to make our experiment a bit more generalizable so that the results of this experiment can be used by others. So we can recommend them, we can give them knowledge. 
So, but all in all, this means that there need to be some kind of audience for your for your knowledge. Um, yeah. Think of a target or audience for your thesis. Who should read your thesis? So the student project proposal is what I want you to work with. Uh, so that is sort of the, the I'm going to give you the link to that one. Uh, but I think I'm going to go through my slides before that. So the student project, project proposal is supposed to answer the question, can I do this project? So many students are giving asking me this, and you've done it during this uh, presentation also. Uh, is this a suitable project? And then I say, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but the, the student project proposal is supposed to help you and us to answer that question. Um, there is going to be a deadline. We've talked about that. It roughly contains background area divided into application area and research area. You know the concepts by now. It should have a description of related work. So if we don't know what other people have worked on, you know, the point, the end of the uh, of the funnel, the research area funnel, then we cannot tell that this is a good project because we don't know. Right. So I need a presentation of the current re related work in order to be able to tell you that this is a good idea or not. Uh, you need to explain what is missing in the related work in order to present the research gap. And then the research gap is what other people have not done yet done. You need to, to map out some part of the research gap for yourself. We call that the knowledge contribution. I want to find out uh, how usable la large language models are in C++ for gen automated unit tests uh, when it comes to accuracy. Uh, so that is the, you know, the specific uh, knowledge contribution. Then I wrote method here, but you are not yet prepared to do method unless you have already done a, a thesis in, in some area, other area. But the methodology part in, in the SPP is your idea on how to achieve that knowledge contribution. And it could be I'm going to do an experiment where I compare a large language model, the um, OpenAI model 3.5 with the 4.0 or whatever the number are. And I'm going to have, um, uh, you know, uh, a number of C++ um, projects with all that already have uh, unit tests so that I can compare the tests from the large language models with the already existing test suite. And I'm going to do an experiment and compare their accuracy. Uh, but it could also be that I'm going to uh, interview uh, five or um, eight uh, programmers that are experts in this area. And yeah, so it could be, we could have different methodologies. Um, we want to be of use. So think about the motivation. Why am I doing this? We can have personal motivations, but we should also have societal motivation or research motivations in this. So the SPP is supposed to find all of these. Um, does that... Does this make sense that we need this in order to be able to say that this is a good project or not? Hopefully. Okay. So there are a number of pitfalls and I've already covered some of these. Um, I want to build X and X could be any program, any, you know, um, library, anything, but really there is no target group for this thing. So no one cares about my solution. It's not really a knowledge contribution because I'm building a project. A, a project itself, a design itself can be a knowledge contribution, but we need to make sure that we look at the different alternatives to your project and we need to compare it, uh, to that, those alternatives. And perhaps we're doing an experiment where we compare our solution with their solution. Um, I want to do an experiment on the thing why, but the experiment gives no usable information on why. Um, and usable means that it's generalizable to others. So if I'm generating unit tests for uh, Hello World programs, that maybe that is not generalizable to real code. So if I want to be able to generalize to real code, maybe I need to generate unit tests for real projects in order to be able to do that. To do that. 
uh, some company wants uh, us to solve their specific application area problem, uh, but this is their specific area, so we have no use of society. Almost always we can twist this a bit. Okay, you want us to create this plugin for the browser, but we are gonna look at the security of plugins, or we're gonna compare two different technologies for uh, plugins because no one has compared these two in these aspects. Um, another pitfall could be, I wanna learn this technology XX, but it's fully explored in books. So if I can find a book on the topic and I'm not doing anything but reading this book, then instead of writing a thesis and reading your thesis, someone who wants that knowledge should read this book. Um, yes, yeah, so the solution is that you have a proper background and that you search for related work and that you've done all of these things. So this is super important and this is the you know what we intend to work with in the workshops. Yes, I think that this is more or less uh, the same things as I've already say, said. Yeah, the, the, wor the word problem formulation is a way of formulating what the pointy end of your, of your knowledge contribution is. So sometimes we formulate that as a question. So for my uh, generating unit tests with large language models, the, uh, so... Uh, we could have the question, uh, is um, OpenAI's model 4 more accurate than 3.5 when it comes to generate uh, unit test use? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to C++. So that is, you know, you formulate it as a question and then your, your methodology answers the question. I think there is a good paper here and I want to copy that link and I'm going to post it in the chat. And uh, because I think this is a good idea when you are starting to work with your uh, SPP and but you already have this research area and application area, then you should read this one. Uh, so that you get a bit of base for your methodology. Tell the story and listen to it if it sounds reasonable. We're going to do that in uh, in the workshop. You need to start reading articles. I've created um, a YouTube video on, on this topic. You should read that Mary Shaw paper that I've done. There are some lectures on the course homepage by uh, Jasper on this. Uh, you should investigate projects. This link is probably not the right one. And then you should attend the workshop next week. And then we're gonna continue with that and I'm gonna try my best to help you. You can work in pairs or individually in this autumn semester. I think that uh, if you work in pairs, you need a, a bit of bigger problems. We're gonna, I, I, we can discuss this separately, but if you're working in pairs, we need to make sure that we can split the project if you choose to in the middle. So this means that we need to have either two parts of research methodology on the same problem or two different problems that are approached uh, so that we can split the work into two if needed. Um, yes. If you're working together, then you should have trackable changes. So Google Drive document with trackable changes so that we can see who has done what. The first workshop is about, you know, uh, this research area and application area, and you're warmly welcome to that. So watch the initial searches and install the plugins. I think that I'm going to put the link to the uh, presentation and the recording of this uh, introduction in uh, Slack also so that you can find it. Okay, so we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Okay, Jan. So uh, how many pages does a classical thesis have? Okay. So I've got, um, I, I think that less than 60, I would say, is a good idea. I've, the shortest thesis that I've seen is around 20 pages. But when it's that short, it needs to be super good. Um, that short thesis is 
I've only seen when you only have a computer science research area and don't have an application area. Usually when you have an application area, it stuff becomes so much more complex and you need to explain both the research area and the application area, and that means more pages. But the number of pages is not as important as the quality of the text within. Or the quality of your work, I would say, actually. Because now text can be produced by large language models, which means that your work needs to stand for itself. You need to produce good work and not only good text. Make sense? Yes. Some um, you know, examiners and they get a thesis of like 120 pages, they just give up. It's not they don't they don't have time to read that. So they cannot examine that and then they say, Oh, you need to cut down. And then I can read it. Some theses, is, you know, almost always we can cut down. Uh, we can, you know, focus stuff more. And when you're starting to re read for this research area and stuff like that, you're going to find out, oh, there are sub areas here. Maybe I should choose one of the sub areas. So dive deeper, dive deeper, dive deeper. If you're so deep within it that you don't find anything done yet, perhaps this is your knowledge gap. And then you step back a bit and say that, okay, these are the related work on, on this a little bit higher level. And there is a knowledge gap here. So, so try to dive and then go back and dive and go back when it comes to this generalizable from computer science to your super specific thing. Okay, more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, if uh, you want to do an idea that already exists, mm -hmm. but you believe it's not like you don't want to implement it better, basically. The implementation mm -hmm. is not good, so you will just want to make a better implementation for mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Would that be okay as well? Yeah, I think so. That sounds like a design science research methodology. Mm -hmm. Then you would describe the current version. So you just in the background you describe you know the papers that describe the current per version of this. You you describe how it works. So for instance, let's imagine that you have some amazing idea for a new algorithm or a new you know something like that. Then you describe the current set of algorithms as your, your related work. So this algorithm works like this. This is the paper where they uh, gave it. Uh, and then we have a, an idea of working with this weight in order to achieve this you know, benefit. And then uh, you are gonna develop the, uh, the thing, the algorithm as a, either, it could be a design or it could be just an algorithm. Uh, if it's just an algorithm, perhaps we do an experiment comparing this algorithm with other algorithms. If it's a design that you're creating some kind of prototype for something, perhaps some security related prototype. We um, developed a honey trap um, in a new way. Um, so, um, and then we evaluated that using experts and then, yeah. Not so sure it that needs, I answered it. Uh, that's okay. So it needs to be like a significant improvement, not just like like copying a website and adding a couple of widgets to make it better. I'd be like, yeah, yeah that that's is, my brush. Yeah, that would not be, you know, um, that would not, would be, not give yeah. anyone anyone anything new. Yeah. So, but but if it would give someone an, uh, something new. Oh. So I have this idea of, of doing this this other way so if we're drawing graphics this way instead with this you know a uh, thing new thing then suddenly we can improve the performance here oh before what if it's better designed let's say yeah but you don't need to succeed in creating something better it just needs to be uh, a question that is unanswered when you start all right so don't feel a pressure to succeed to create something better but if unless we can Imagine that this can be done better by this way than um, by the methodology workshop. Then, then um, yeah, it should not be trivial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank more, you. More questions. Um, uh, for um, supervisor and these things, because uh, you said like we contact those uh, researchers uh, mm -hmm. or some people who work in. Um, computer department mm -hmm. so is it like we can just contact everyone or you have some list of uh, people who we can okay yeah so i do have a list of people that you can contact that i know have you know gotten uh, time for supervision in this course this semester 
So I'm gonna um, pop, pop, pop. I'm gonna drop their names. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, Faiz. Uh, mm, I'm writing to everyone now, right? We have Farid, Adrisi. We have Matthias, David, Son. We have uh, Neda, what's her uh, last name? Maleki, I think. Uh, we have Rafa L. Martins. And you might also have me, but I would prefer, I I'm, you know, um, worst case scenario, I step in. Uh, so because I, instead of being a supervisor, I want to supervise your supervisor and you, so to speak. I, I want to um, use my time that way. So, but I'm the, uh, um, um, for instance, if we have a a, a a supervisor that doesn't work, for instance, becomes sick, then I'm the one who's stepping, right? Yeah. Uh, what do I think supervisor specializes in? Mm -hmm. I think that looking at their their profiles okay. on the yeah. LMU website would be a good idea. Yeah. Mm. And uh, one more question about uh, software engineering, like you were saying, could you just give some example, let's say, if you want? Because I mean, the most, uh, like, the, the best thing for me is like software engineering or engineering or something like that. But like, mm -hmm. if you can just give some example for that, it would be very helpful. Okay. So, um, uh, because our time is running out, and I'd see that I got a, a DM here where someone was talking to me, to me personally, which I, so I'm sorry, I don't have time because I need to run uh, after this. But do write to me uh, on Slack as a DM. Uh, for your uh, question, uh, Sasan, for the software engineering, do look at Wikipedia on software engineering, what that is, what that encapsulates, and then uh, look into that. I think this this is all part of your work for um, for the first workshop, so so to speak. So it's it's good work to look into. Okay, what is computer science? What's not computer science? Hmm. Sure. So Thank I'm you. just pushing it back because I don't have time. Uh, so it's 12 o'clock and I need to run because I need to pick up uh, and be uh, the uh, personal driver of my daughter. I'm sorry, uh, you who wrote to me, but write to me on Slack and I'll try to answer you uh, this afternoon. So the, um, yes, that is it. Thank you, everyone.